Today on the Crew Reviews, we have the honor of interviewing New York Times bestselling author, Brad Taylor. Brad served for more than 21 years, retiring as a Special Forces Lieutenant Colonel. During that time, he held numerous infantry and Special Forces positions, including eight years in 1st Special Forces Operational Detachment, Delta, where he commanded multiple troops and a squadron. Most of the operations he was involved in remain classified today. In 2011, Brad published his debut novel, One Rough Man, which was an immediate success and launched the Pike Logan series. With 13 previous installments and more than 2 million copies sold, the series has consistently hit the New York Times bestselling list. His latest installment, book number 14, Hunter Killer, is set to release January 7th, 2020. And now allow me to introduce to you Brad Taylor. All right, we want to welcome Mr. Brad Taylor to the show. How are you, sir? All right, thank you. Welcome, Brad. Doing well. Welcome, Brad. My Host on and on. My camera's the worst of the bunch, mm. apparently. It's that soft lens, I heard. <laughs> All right, so, um, you know, we're going to ask you a few questions here, and I'm going to start this thing off with a bang. Um, your first novel, uh, One Rough Man, debuted in 2011. Hunter Killer marks your 14th Pike Logan series book. Um, did you realize what you'd signed up for when you were pushing out two books a year for so long? <laughs> Or was somebody uh, no. secretly trying to run you into the ground during that phase? <laughs> no, actually, what happened was the, uh, you, you guys are all writers. You write current events. And so I, I still had to put uh, food on the table. Kids still need shoes. And so I was doing a ton of security contracting. And so I would look at my schedule and say, okay, the book's due in December, but you've got a contract from July to January. Um, you got to get in in July. And so I did. And then uh, I would say, why aren't you putting my book out? Why is my book coming out? <laughs> and uh, they're like, well, you're not our only author, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> December is when your book's coming out. But I was mm -hmm. petrified that something was going to go wrong on the world stage. It would make the entire book, you know, moot. Because, you know, if we went to war in Iran or whatever it was, yeah. it would ruin the book. And so I kept saying that over and over. And I kept doing security contracts. And I kept getting my books in six months in. And my publisher said, okay, smarty pants, we'll do two a year. If you want to go on that schedule. <laughs> You want to go in July? That's fine. We'll go in July and December. Oof. And I signed up for it. And uh, after about four years of that, I was like, I'm done with this. You win. <laughs> I, I can't do this anymore. Oh, it, all, it only took four years. <laughs> <laughs> well, that last one, I mean, uh, Ring of Fire was the last one I did. And uh, I remember looking at my wife and going, we're doomed. <laughs> There's absolutely no way I'm finishing this because it just it starts encroaching, 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 encroaching until, you know, you're now two months. And you've got to get a whole book out. And I was like, we are absolutely doomed. Holy Good crap. Lord. Ugh. Do you have a, along those lines, do you have a daily word count that you just have to hit or, or do you just kind of go? No. With the gut? I used to do that because I, I mean, I'm, I never take any classes on writing or anything. You just read on the net, you know, here's what people do. And so I tried to do that, 2,000 words a day, 1,500 words a day, something like that. And I, invariably, if I force it out, I'd end up deleting it. And so I'll go, you know, five days without writing. And, well, I'm always writing. People always assume that writing is I'm on the keyboard. Yeah. You're always writing. You're just not on the keyboard. And so I'll let all that percolate in my head until I'm ready to write. And then I'll bang out, you know, 70,000 words a day for three days. And that's kind of my schedule. I've learned just to trust my instincts. I used to, I get all panicked because I can't figure it out. And what am I going to do? Yeah. Uh, and, and so far it hasn't failed me. Although my wife's now saying that, you know, you have a book due, right? <laughs> <laughs> that subtle reminder. <laughs> subtle. So Brad, like a, like a good bottle of wine, you keep getting better with age and Hunter Killer is already getting some, it. it's You're getting great reviews and, and every year a book comes out. The reviews are, he topped the last one, which is extremely hard to do. Um, yeah. But I'm curious with the task force novels, what have you learned these last, especially maybe since you stopped writing the two books a year and you have a little more breathing room, what have you learned in these, these, uh, this time span that you could wish you could go back and tell the younger Brad Taylor who's writing One Rough Man? What would you tell yourself? Uh, I think the main thing, uh, I mean, you've got your entire life to write your first book. I mean, it doesn't yeah. matter. I, I never even thought it was going to get published. So mm -hmm. it's just, you're writing your first book. And, uh, there's a lot of fat, even to this day, I'll reread the book. And there's some things in that book that I'm just like, wow, you wrote that. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> Other things I'm like, man, I'd cut that. What's that doing? How'd that end up in there? Um, so the main thing is just cutting the fat and leaving the meat. There's a lot of stuff that I did expository. I mean, when I first wrote one, one rough man, it was a, uh, 
190,000 page or 190,000 word manuscript. Jeez. And it's because I was doing history on everything. So Pike goes across Breach Inlet here in Charleston, and that's where the Hunley submarine went off. And there's this five pages of the Hunley submarine going off and doing something, which has <laughs> nothing to do with the book. Everybody loves backstory. So, right. So I used to enjoy, you know, the history of this stuff. And so every time I'd see a piece of history, I'd write about it. Well, I've learned that, okay, a little bit of history is okay. You don't need five pages of it. The guy's going to put the book down. He doesn't want to read that. Yeah. None of that made it in one North man. You won't see the Hunley submarine. In it. <laughs> but it was in there to begin with. <laughs> That's a novella. So, yeah. so the mission in Hunter Killer is a little bit more personal, you know, beyond Pike just doing things for yeah. national security reasons and such. And I'm curious, in your total career, uh, in military career, was there ever a mission where the lines between personal and professional were blurred? Um, no, I would never say they were blurred. I would say they were there, but they weren't blurred. In other words, I've never done anything where the – the professional side said, you can't do this. And the personal side said, well, I'm going to do it anyway. Hmm. They, mm -hmm. they may have been together, um, but they were never blurred in the sense where I was doing something outside of what the professional side was saying. Just happened to be lucky enough to say, okay, it's sure. worked out. That they know of, yeah. <laughs> so what did, what did you draw on to kind of create the, the fictional aspect of that and, and to, you know, to have, your, have Pike Logan sort of – kind of go against his grain um, and, and kind of delve into the personal? Well, I guess most of it is, I mean, everybody's had loss in life and it's basically all it is. And you always want to um, justify the loss that there's a reason that somebody, something happened. There's a reason that my mom got cancer first. There's a reason that my buddy stepped on an IED. There's some, something going on here that should be a reason for it. Uh, and sometimes there's not. And it just happens. Yeah. And then Pike doesn't want to believe that. He wants to believe there is a reason, and he's going to figure out that reason. Mm. Hmm. So, uh, so Brad, you, you were talking about how, how, how much you write or how you were writing those two books a year, but you've also written as many novellas, uh, almost yeah. as many novellas as you have novels. And your latest one, Exit Fee, featuring Pike Logan and Jennifer Cahill, came out in October. Do, do you take yeah. a different approach when writing or researching novellas? And, uh, yeah. Go ahead. The, the books are uh, um, obviously a full scope thing, and you've got to go into it wholeheartedly from start to finish. I mean, we talked earlier. I just came back from Taiwan and Australia and all that because I'm doing research for the next novel. I was all over Brazil for Hunter Killer. There's not a spot in that book that I haven't actually set foot on. Um, the novellas are always something that's tickling the back of my head about – you know, what happened here? What happened there? Maybe I'd like to explore that. And for Exit Fee, it was basically uh, in Daughter of War. Amina was in Daughter of War. She's the title of the book, Daughter of War. And uh, I was going to whack her. I mean, right off. She's chapter four. <laughs> she's dead. Bang. Exit stage left. Let's get Pike rolling. <laughs> and um, I liked her too much. So I said, I'm going to let her live. And so she ended up being a, it took over the book. The book actually was, uh, uh, the title was changed to Daughter of War after I finished it because she was all the way in it. And, but when I was done, when you write the book, you, you've, you're setting something in stone. You can't just go back and say I, that didn't happen. So if you make a character that's got blue eyes, well, he's got blue eyes forever. You yeah. can't have brown eyes in the next book. Well, I made Amina. She's there. She's alive. I didn't kill her. And so I was trying to go through my head. Of, well, what am I going to do with her? How am I going to fix this? What am, how's this going to work? How are the relationship going to work? And all that. And um, that's where the short story came out of. It was just me basically fleshing out, here's what's going to happen. So it'll feed into uh, the next book, just in my head, not necessarily like the novella feeds into it, but just getting my thoughts out on the page of what am I going to do with Amina? And it ended up being a pretty good short story. And so I told my publisher, hey, I got this 30,000 words here. You want it? And he said, <laughs> okay. So do you find the, uh, it sounds like it's, it's freer. Um, not so much oversight from like the publisher looking at your outlines oh, and whatnot. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause I, I, is that enjoyable, more enjoyable? Uh, well, I don't know if there's, uh, I don't, I, I used to get, uh, I mean, everything's an evolution. So, you know, I wrote one rough man and it, it was purchased. I had a uh, five page editorial letter, which was, here's all the stuff you need to fix, which was enormous. Wow. Number one, get rid of the Hunley. <laughs> you know, it was all this stuff going through there. And uh, then as, it, as I went through my writing career, it got slower and slower and smaller and smaller until I had uh, uh, one paragraph saying you should do this. And then it was, let's do two books a year 
and it was just comments in the margin. So I would say that writing the novellas, uh, if I was going to compare it to my early career, yeah, they're much freer because they, they don't really care at that point. They, they just wanted the novellas to lead into the book. And they didn't care what I wrote. Um, but nowadays when I write a book, it's kind of the same thing. They don't, hmm. they don't get a lot of pushback. Huh. Hey, um, I, I remember way back in One Rough Man, you know, when, it was my first book I, I picked up of yours. And it was, a, it was really the first time that I had seen first person, third person, you know, situation yeah. in, in, a, in a book of, of this type. So did you, how conscious was that decision? And then did you ever get any pushback from, from folks <laughs> yes. about not doing that versus doing that? Oh, yeah. That? Well, that's a lucky thing about not having any writing instruction because yeah. I didn't realize that was a rule. I mean, people <laughs> always ask me, how'd you know to break that rule? I'm like, what rule? <laughs> like you can't put first person, third person, same book. And I'm like, well, uh, cause my writing instructors have been authors that I've read. Nelson mm -hmm. DeMille's done it. Joseph Fender's done it. There's a bunch of people have done it. Yeah. And, um, the John Corey stories, you know, Plum Island, that's exactly what he does. And I like Great that. book. Great so book. So I, uh, Excellent. I, I did it because that's what I was like. I like that. I read, I enjoyed that book and that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. And then I get asked, you know, how'd you know to break that rule? And I'm like, I didn't, nobody told me there was a rule. <laughs> If I'd have known it was a rule, I would have done it. I guarantee it. I just said, I can't do that. <laughs> oh, that's too good. So Pike is clearly the, um, you know, the signature character of your stuff, but I kind of, I, I think of your books almost as an ensemble piece uh, where, you know, there's some fully realized supporting characters and even antagonists that are sort of essential to, to the, the family that you've created in the book uh, for lack of a better term. Um, was that a, do you view your, first of all, do you view your novels that way more as an ensemble yeah. piece or is it, is it always a Pike Logan story? No, no, actually they, my publisher calls it the Pike Logan thriller. Uh, for me, at the baseline, it's always been Pike and Jennifer thrillers, period. Mm -hmm. They were 50, 50, mm -hmm. one rough man have been in ever since. And the other characters that have been developed, um, to the point where sometimes I end up killing a character and I regret it like decoy. I wish I had never done that. Oh, but I, uh, I, mean, it, yeah, I know you do it and it's the end of it. <laughs> but Aaron and Shoshana, they just, I was going to kill those two too. They were dead meat at the end of that book. They were gone. And, uh, I just put them on the shelf. I didn't had no future for them. I just didn't want to kill them. And they sat on the shelf until one day I had it. I was writing the story and, uh, I needed to have uh, a couple of characters that had to do A, B, C, and D. And I'm like, well, you, you got those people on the shelf. You, you never used them before. Yeah. And they came back in the book and uh, I got all kinds of fan mail. Oh, wonderful. They're back. They're back. They're back. And I'm like, wow, thank God I didn't kill them. <laughs> so I was going <laughs> to. But I do develop it. And that's a lot where the novellas come in too. So like the recruit is Knuckles and Decoy solely. The targets, Aaron and Shoshana solely. There's a bunch of the novellas that don't have Pike and Jennifer in it. Uh, and wow. it's just the cast of characters I've built out there. So when, keeping, when you began with One Rough Man, was, was that your intent or did you kind of, did that happen organically where you thought, you know what? Uh, it's absolutely organic. I, I didn't, I didn't think I'd have one book published, much less a third book where I'm introducing something. Right. Right. Uh, even with um, The Ghost was in actually the third book, Enemy of Mine. The Ghost is this, uh, a Palestinian assassin that's running around. He's not a, uh, I would call him amoral versus evil. He's definitely got his reasons for doing what he's doing, but you, you I mean, I've, talk to a bunch of bad guys and you're always like, why is that guy running around killing everybody? He sounds so normal. Uh, right. And then you get his backstory and it's like, well, he's running around killing everybody because he's had a hard life, but that still doesn't give him a reason to do that. Um, and so I had actually had him on the shelf and I was writing Ghost of, no, I was writing uh, Polaris Protocol in Mexico against the drug cartels and they had a Hezbollah theme there and they needed somebody to infiltrate Hezbollah and they, I was like, I got this guy I didn't kill. He's, he's actually in prison. <laughs> I'm going to pull him out, throw yeah, him that in was there. Good. So that I, it's, but it's absolutely organic. It's not like I, if anybody, well, I guess some people can do it, but I'm not one that can sit there and say, I'm going to put this guy aside and six books <laughs> from now, he will come back. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I'm not that smart. <laughs> it's, it seems like the fans really love though. When you, when you do pull those guys off the shelf and throw them in there, throw them in the mix. They do. And it's some of them actually, uh, it's surprised that, that, you know, you get a, an email from somebody saying, I'm so glad to see him back. And sometimes they're just characters that didn't really matter. Uh, like I'm right now, Duncan, who was only in one book, no, no fortunate son he was in. And I'm putting him back in because uh, he left the task force and now I needed, he, 
it was no big deal. He was just a small guy in the book. Hmm. But I need a guy that's working with the F-35 and uh, doing BAE systems and all that. And I was like, no, that guy fits, and I haven't used him anymore. So I pluck him off the shelf, throw him in there, let him run a buck. Do you, do you keep like a uh, little – I, mean, I keep notes, you know, the papers and, mm-hmm. and whatnot. Do you take all your character backstories and like put them in a folder and like label them? Are you that guy? <laughs> I wish I was that guy. I'm that guy now. <laughs> I was not that guy to start out with. I just started doing it. And it's become so painful to, uh, it's like if I'm writing Aaron Bergman, I'm like, how tall was that guy? What did he look like? And you, you got to go back to the very first book and, you know, search and replace for Aaron Bergman. Here's the guy. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and because I haven't done that, and uh, we're actually in the process of doing it right now, uh, cataloging every single character because I never did it. And it's bit me in the ass over and over again. So I wrote uh, No Fortunate Son where Kurt Hale was a geographic bachelor. And um, he's, uh, uh, you know, he's got a cousin or a nephew or niece that he loves, but he's never been married. And uh, then I get the mail. Hey, uh, what happened to Kurt Hale's wife? I was like, what are they talking about? I go to one rough man. Oh, he was married. Whoops. There's a novella right there. She was going to an orphanage, <laughs> delivering cookies, <laughs> got hit by Metro. Dead. <laughs> so, She's dead. <laughs> that's happened a few times. So oh, I really so, do need to do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, as Sean said, Pike Logan's your guy. He's one, of the, he's one of the best protagonists in the business and a fixture on the New York Times bestseller list. Um, but have you ever thought of leaving the series completely and moving on to something else? Um, not really. I, I have, I mean, obviously you sit there and think about different things you can do. I've thought about spinoffs, like maybe doing a Knuckles book only or something like that. Aaron and Shoshana book, but usually I, they end up being novellas. And the reason I haven't is because, um, honestly, if I wrote something completely different then uh, well, I mean, if I wrote in the same genre, but different characters, I'd be basically writing Pike Logan and Jennifer Cahill, except now instead of blue eyes, he's got brown eyes. And instead of her own blonde hair, she has brown hair or something like that. It would end up being the same thing. Now, if I completely shifted genres, uh, I suppose I could, but that's, you know, multi throw is kind of a thing. <laughs> so, what, 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 what genre would, uh, would Brad Taylor write if he wasn't? I see, if I could, if I. <laughs> 50 Shades of Pike is coming next. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it would be. Uh, I'd probably write a murder mystery. That's what I read. John Sanford, Robert Crace, that kind of stuff. Oh, oh Sanford's great. good. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I do. No sci-fi, no fantasy, no dragons and Game no. of Thrones type stuff. So, no, my wife says you ought to, I used to read a ton of sci-fi uh, when I was in the military, and she's like, you ought to write sci-fi. And I'm like, that is too hard. you got to come up with some reason for everything. <laughs> Nobody's got to read. <laughs> but you don't have to proton anything, plasma though. radiation, <laughs> you have to at least make it sound real. You know, like the force, you describe this whole thing, the lightsaber. I was like, ah, I'm not doing that. <laughs> So, uh, only. jumping back to Hunter Killer, um, any of your fans that have watched interviews or read, inter- or, you know, have read stuff about you, they know you had uh, quite an adventure when you went to South Africa for Operator Down. They yeah. know about your uh, your issues that you got, you know, a little detained, and and and. So I don't want that story. I think people have heard it, although it's a great story. Um, did any? But Hunter Killer was, you know, predominantly in Brazil. Mm-hmm. Um, can you talk about anything there and maybe something that you just didn't plan that kind of organically happened and then all of a sudden found its way into the book? Yeah, two things, actually. There was uh, number one, which is kind of gross. The, uh, um, most of the toilets down in Brazil, you can't flush the toilet paper. It has to go into the trash can, oh, which, nice. has, which hasn't sorry, happened what? to me since I was in Saddam's palace in Iraq. <laughs> and so everywhere we went, even in the nice hotels, like don't flush the toilet paper. And so you got all the stinky toilet paper Ugh, in, the, uh, nice. in the trash can, which I would have never known if I hadn't gone down there. But that introduced, okay, how am I going to get this guy compromised if he's breaking into this room? Well, the maids come five times a day into the toilet paper. And that's how that happens. Uh, another one was um, we had, there's black, there's, go and no-go areas all over Brazil. And, uh, you know, I was all worried about somebody's going to steal my wallet and all this kind of stuff. We were on the beach at Coco Cabana and I had my bag in front of me and somebody came by and said, don't leave your bag right there. Somebody will run by here and steal it. But other than that, you're perfectly safe. Say, all right. I'll have a beer. Put that bag. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, sit the, on your bag. <laughs> the go areas at nighttime are uh, completely full of people, tourists all over the place. Great environment. Uh, the, the Brazilians are very friendly, very nice. But one block away is like, don't ever go there. 
if you leave the lights, they're going to get you. And uh, we had a guy we used all day long, and it got nighttime. He was walking us around, showing us everything. And uh, we met him again the next morning, and he was, looked like he was all bed raggled. He had just, just tired. And I said, oh, you look like you had a rough night. And he said, yeah, I couldn't get back to my car. I parked it there in the daytime, and then when nighttime comes, you don't go to that car because somebody's going to, you know, mug you. Jeez. So I had to sleep somewhere else and then get my car in the morning to come meet you. And I was like, you're kidding. What? So, <laughs> we have the thoughts to just say, uh, hey, Brad, it's getting dark. I got to get my car. But he didn't Sounds do like, that. Like so. New Orleans. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that made it a book, too. Yeah. So it's only yeah, well, it night. depends on the areas. It all, it, it, mm. Everything's like that. But there, that one scene of daylight was fine, nighttime was not, makes it okay. another book. Mm. Well, speaking of research trips, um, as Eric mentioned, um, we know about your little escapade in Africa. Um, um, and I also know uh, your wife runs a pretty tight ship. So oh, yeah. any locations that she's denied you access to uh, <laughs> since those No, times? actually, she lets me go wherever I want to go. And she actually had uh, um, her first research trip was No Fortunate Son because she got sick of being left behind. Yeah. She usually doesn't hear the stories until later. I mean, I, I was down in Mexico. And uh, the Zola is, is where the, uh, all the tourists are. In fact, it's the main uh, scene for Daniel Craig, the James Bond movie, when they're running around with the skull masks on, shooting oh, at the yeah, beginning. Yeah. Well, right north of that is a barrio called Tapito, which is a very, very bad area. I mean, you can buy drugs and guns and hand grenades and you name it. Jeez. Mm. And it's off limits to Americans. Well, I had a buddy of mine who was Navy SEALs working down in the embassy, and I said, hey, he's – is this really off limits or, I mean, I don't want to get killed, but is yeah. this just something the embassy says? Cause the embassy will say anything's off limits just to keep you from going. Yeah. And uh, he said, well, I'll hook you up. So he gives me this journalist and we, the first thing we do is get an unregistered cab, which is, should have been a warning right off the bat because <laughs> nobody gets an unregistered cab. You, they never get out. You sure was a cab? <laughs> but this, well, this guy spoke uh, fluent Spanish. He'd been down there for 20 years and um, we went and rip it off to Tapito and we got stuck in there and it was just inching along. I could see the end of the street like a hundred meters away, but everybody was banging on the hood and everything. And the cab driver, I had, I was, didn't even have my camera up. Cause I'm like, I don't want anybody to see me take a picture. I'm not going to get mad at me. Yeah. And they're all looking at the green go in the car and <laughs> um, cab driver turns around and screams something at me, which I don't speak Spanish. And I'm like, what do you say? He said, lock the doors. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> we lock all the doors and we inch through that whole thing and finally got out on the street. And there was a uh, El Muerto, the dawn of the <laughs> dead statue sitting right there. Ugh. And uh, I was like, man, alive. That's, that was pretty scary. And he said, yeah, thank God you were here. I was like, what? What? <laughs> I would have never even gone if you said it was unsafe. <laughs> well, I never would have gone if you weren't in the car. I was like, that's insane. So I told Elaine that story when I got back, and she's like, you're going to get it and end up in somebody's trunk. There was another time, too, when I was in Doha Cutter. <laughs> I, got, I hired a Pakistani driver uh, who was unregistered. And Elaine was like, you're going to be in the trunk of his car and gone. <laughs> See you <there. laughs> So your life insurance policy got upped. Wait, wait where? So that was in Pakistan? Uh, no, I was in Doha, Qatar, and it was actually uh, Ramadan, so there wasn't any food. And he gave me his phone to go get minutes on his phone so I could call him because I was doing all kinds of research running around. And I get to the uh, phone place inside this nice mall, which ended up the book, and uh, his phone's locked. I can't call him. I mean, I can't open it. I can't do anything. So now he's out driving around. It's 7,000 <laughs> degrees. It's Ramadan. Nobody's serving food. <laughs> So I walk to the Four Seasons and uh, I get into Four Seasons and I say, you know, do you guys serve food anywhere? And they say, yeah, in the basement, you can get some food. You, all you gringos can go down underneath. <laughs> and so I went downstairs and um, I got a hamburger and a Coke, a hamburger and a Coke. And it was $75. I was like, you have got What? Jeez. <laughs> oh, wow. So I said, I'm gonna, you want to know why uh, Four Seasons is blown up? Ah. I got out of there and said, I'm blowing this whole place up. <laughs> I said, 75 bucks for a hamburger. I'm blowing up the whole area. This whole hotel is crumbling. You do, so, don't overcharge Brad Taylor. Right. Blow your shit up. <laughs> in the book. Well, remember, another surprise free drinks, about, drinks, everyone. Free drinks, remember. About publishing is I thought for sure that uh, my publisher would pull out the fact that it's actually the four seasons and turn it into the five seasons or something. Yeah. <laughs> but they left it four seasons and I blew the hell out of it because you charged me 75 bucks for hamburger <laughs> the more you know outrageous <laughs> was it good no it's like a regular hamburger what do you mean that good yeah. <laughs> so was the the oft-repeated story about you getting detained was that 
post military was that your most harrowing experience uh, traveling? Uh, I actually would say Tapito was probably my most harrowing. I really thought Tapito, we weren't getting out of there. Uh, wow. It only took, it lasted about uh, 30 minutes. Just, we went 100 meters and it was 30 minutes inching through, but they, the way they were banging on the car and everything, that was most harrowing. Now I spent eight hours in interrogation with those guys, but I kind of knew I'm an American citizen and they're, you know, they haven't slapped me around yet. So they're probably not going to start. Um, when the sun went down, that's probably when I kind of amped up and said, okay, now it's time to get out of here. Jeez. So if, I, if I'm correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but your last military uh, posting was actually as a military professor at the Citadel. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So tell me what about what from that experience did you take and apply to your writing, if anything? Mainly that if you teach ROTC, you get like eight hours a day free, <laughs> which is plenty of writing. <laughs> That's where you wrote your first I mean, book, right? Yeah. I mean, it was like getting off a bullet train from where I came from, a special mission unit. And now I'm kind of low crawl and there's nothing going on. It's like nine in the morning. What are we doing now? Yeah, nothing. <laughs> Teach classes and just rinse and repeats. Once you had the classes built, it was just rinse and repeat. I mean, you're teaching the same class over and over again, going to the field doing the same thing. every time. So I had a lot of time on my hands. That's why I wrote the book. Did you, did you ask for that billing? I didn't write on a government computer though. No. Oh. I did. I wanted to, yeah, I needed a break, actually. It was, I was supposed to go to SOCOM. There's a whole bunch of places I was supposed to go to, and I said, no, I'm, I'm getting a break. And the XO down to Citadel, it's actually the XO of the battalion that's down there, is always an SF billet. And it's not coded that way. It's just kind of undercover brother stuff. Uh. So I contacted the guy that was down there and said, hey, how'd you get that billet? And he said, uh, um, well, it's thrown, run through SF command, blah, blah, blah. You need to talk to the commander of the Eastern Seaboard. And it turned out the commander of the Eastern Seaboard was my uh, S3 when I was a second lieutenant. Oh, jeez. like, wow, this works out. Small hey, world. Hey, you remember me? <laughs> You're and, not I mean, in. I said, here's what I've done. Can I go be the XO Citadel? I'm sure he was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How would you want to do that? <laughs> so that's where we went. I want to go where the action is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Send me where the action is. I want to blow it up. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any uh, anxiety though when you're you know going from thousand miles an hour to low crawling? Uh, no, it was a good group of people. Teaching the cadets is a lot of fun, and it really was. And I really needed a break, and uh, there wasn't any anxiety at all. I had some funny instances that uh, are embarrassing now. Um, well, now because, we have to know. Well, <laughs> like there's, I never wore a uniform, so you'd put your uniform at work and you take your uniform off and come home. Now I wore a uniform everywhere I went. Uh, which I felt like, so the first one was I took my daughter to school, which I'd never been able to do. And she said, you know, why are you wearing a costume? <laughs> like, costume. costume. You know, I'm in the military, right? <laughs> <laughs> and the other one was I was at, uh, I was getting gas and I'm fueling my vehicle up and this guy kept staring at me and I felt real self-conscious wearing BDUs. Yeah. Um, and he's just staring, staring, staring. So I go inside to pay. And uh, he's still staring at me. And I turn around and I cursed at him and said, you know, what the heck do you want? You got a problem with me? <laughs> and um, he said, no, my daughter's never met a Green Beret. She wanted to shake your hand. Oh. So like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, then it's like, she probably never wants to meet another one. Now. Yeah, they're all assholes. <laughs> yeah. This is how they all are. All so of. that was the only anxiety was learning to be a military person walking around. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Well, you're supposed to be incognito, and here you are just advertising your, your entire career yeah. to everybody. Yeah. <clears throat> but I had you a lot would, of fun there. Yeah. So, uh, so thriller, you know, thriller writers with military backgrounds like yourself and others, including Jack Carr, um, they have their novels scoured by someone over at the Pentagon. Can you explain that process? And uh, can you share if you've had any problems with it <laughs> problems no i'm blowing up the pentagon I've, I've talked to jack about this and so i'm not i don't want to conflict with him but the, i mean the the review process at the pentagon i mean if you submit a book for review they're going to review it but the review process is if you write anything that's official nonfiction that you had a uh, tangential relationship with so if i'm going to write about policy in syria i'm going to write about special operations forces in iraq i'm going to write my own bio whatever it is that gets reviewed Fiction does not have to be reviewed. And I, I told him that. <laughs> but if you submit it, they're going to review it. I mean, if you say, here's my book, they're going to go, okay. And then they're going to take out every word but the, you know, because they don't like anything. And uh, he had, may have had different uh, uh, instructions when he left. I don't know. And he left six years after I did. He left after, actually after uh, 
uh, No Easy Day and all the other slew of books came out. So he yeah. may have gotten different instruction, but I, when I left, that's what they told me and I'm not going back. There's no <laughs> way I'm going through what he did. Uh, they have been reviewed. I mean, when No Easy Day came out, uh, anybody who'd written anything, it was soft. I mean, if you wrote a gardening book, you were getting reviewed. I was in a skiff. I got interrogated. Every one of my books got reviewed. Um, came out of clean mental health, but uh, I mean, it was a rough eight months of doing Really? That. So who, who are these people that are reviewing? What are their backgrounds that give them the knowledge? Le to Their legal to department. It's a legal it's actually, department. It's, 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 I mean, that's another thing is it depends on uh, what you're talking about. So the State Department has a review process. The CIA has a review process. The FBI has a review process. And the Department of Defense has theirs. All mm -hmm. of those are different. Uh, for instance, the CIA, you can write a gardening book and they're going to review it. They don't care what you write. By yeah. the CIA rules, it's going to get reviewed. Um, FBI, same way. Don Bentley's got a book coming out. He has right. to have his reviewed by the FBI. Right. Not by the Department of Defense, because he was an Apache pilot, but he's writing about you know, other stuff. Since he was an FBI special agent, they had to review his book, because that's their rules. That's what they do. Secret uh, Service, you don't. Oh, you don't at all? Well, uh, I submitted mine as a, as a courtesy, but then they, because it's fiction, as, as you right. said, you don't have to, um, right. but they highlighted a bunch of stuff in my book and they were like, would you mind changing yeah. the wording? Well, that's not to say there? I've got, I mean, I, my books are read by a bunch of operators before it ever goes anywhere. And if they come back and say, I, I, you need to change this. Usually it's because uh, I coincidentally did something that I had no idea was going on. <laughs> that was uh, real. Yeah. They, that was real. And they said, Hey, just take that out. This, can you change that? And I, and I will. I'm like, Oh, sorry. I didn't know that was actually a, a thing. thing. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so that's the, pretty much the extent of it though. So a lot of the times, I mean, they were trying to find all kinds of stuff. You know, I got a guy's named Abu bag of donuts. Did you ever chase Abu bag of donuts in Iraq? Like I'd used his name for, <laughs> you know, some posterity reasons. No, I didn't. Everything in there is fake. Um, but you technically don't have to, but the people who are reviewing it, and the reason we're reviewing it, and I actually wrote a blog on this, is they want to make sure that there's no classified in the book. And you don't know what's classified because by definition, it's classified. <laughs> and I'll oh, give you a good example of that is uh, um, the uh, uh, Nick Rowe, Five Years of Freedom. So he told them all along, he's captured by the Viet Cong, he's told them all along that he's an uh, uh, engineer. He's not special forces, he's an engineer. He's not special forces. Well, a bunch of war, man, I war activists uh, his paper at home, his family paper wrote up this big glowing review of how he's special forces commando badass and he's been captured in Vietnam. Great. They took that to North Vietnam and handed it over to him and they were going to execute Nick Rowe. Now the paper wasn't doing anything bad. They didn't know there was anything wrong with that. But if it had gone in front of any kind of review board, they just said, don't write that. This guy is a POW <laughs> and they're going to cut his head off if they realize he's a you know, special forces guy. Right. So that kind of stuff, when he writes a nonfiction book, you may meet somebody, you went to Halo school with somebody and you took a picture with him and you said, what's the big deal with this? I'm going to put this picture in. You don't know what that guy's doing now right. because it's classified. He could be doing anything. And that's what they're looking for is to say, hey, you get rid of that picture. That guy is now doing stuff for us that you don't need to know about. But if that picture gets out, he's in trouble. It's and that's what the yeah. review process is. Right. It's good to have then. I mean, it's a yeah. necessary, necessary. Uh, well, there's no uh, doubt that they'll cut a ton of it. I mean, it's, the Department of Defense has no interest in you selling a book. They have every interest in it. They're going to defer on their on – whatever helps them is what they're going to defer to. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff. I've seen some of the stuff that was cut out of uh, Jack Carr's book, and I'm kind of like, oh, really? You know, George Butler was just doing that with Morgan Freeman on a movie. <laughs> and, uh, but that's right? what they're going to do. They're going to yeah. Nope, that's going. Cutting that yeah. out. Yeah. National Geographic just did a whole right. expose on the president's motorcade and all the special vehicles and – but you want me to take it out? Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just did a bunch of DARPA medical stuff. And thank God I wasn't in there because nobody's going to review that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Brad, you know, I know when you got into this, you probably didn't realize you'd be doing the uh, self-promotion side. So you, you can't be a novelist no. nowadays and not have social media presence or maybe having someone do it for you, whatever the case is. But there's definitely a heavy dose of self-promotion that's needed to sell books. Um, and you're active, you know, obviously we see your tweets. Um, do you ever sometimes though, find yourself type something out and be like, you know what? Delete on that. And, and is, is yeah, there certain topics that. you try to avoid because you just, <laughs> I know literally just storm. did that. <laughs> you literally just did that. 
I'm the crew review sucks. Oh, so, no. wait till I'm on. The crew, was, uh, I don't what did you say about me, Brad, and, and why? <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, definitely about was, Eric. <laughs> there was a discussion going on about the pardons that uh, just happened for the war criminals. Yeah. And I have some thoughts about that. And so I weighed in. And um, afterwards, I was kind of like, eh, that's not what you need to do. Actually, Elaine, the DCOE was like, did you tweet while I was out of the house? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> How dare you? So there was a lot of them that went back and forth. And uh, then I was like, I'm deleting all those. That's not, I don't want to get involved in politics. It's not where I want to go. And it's not what I want to do. So, yeah, yeah I deleted them. Oh, I'll say a topic like that probably is something good that you've done well in the past is your blogs. You're, when, when there's yeah. like kind of a, a yeah. hot topic item, you've been really one of the predominant authors to, you know, write an article about it that's thought provoking, but gives your background, you know, you're, you're normally when if it's about the assault rifles, you know, I know that one was a really powerful one because people don't know what they're talking about when it comes to weapons most right. of the time. They're just repeating what the other person <laughs> said on Twitter, which yeah. every idiot yeah. with the Twitter account thinks they're an expert. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, that, that seemed like I that actually haven't, I haven't blogged nearly as much as I should. It's because we're so polarized that, um, yeah. you can't write about anything that somebody doesn't take as a personal attack on them because of the party they represent. And, right. and you, I could write about uh, national security affairs, for instance, the pardons we were just talking about. I was going to write a whole blog on that stuff. And um, it's just too political. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if you could just, if you took it in a vacuum and said, on Mars, these three guys did X and here's what happened. And you wrote a blog about it. That would be one thing. Nowadays, it's like, I hate you because you hate this guy. So I'm not even yeah. writing about that guy. I'm writing about this case. Right, right. right. So, it gets so hard to do. Uh, the other quick thing, the follow-up to that was, and you, you, you alluded to it as a joke of the deputy commander of everything stepped out when you, tw you started tweeting. Is she your sounding board, though? Does sometimes you'd be like, I'm going to, you know, I got this. I'm going to tweet yeah. this. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. She definitely is. She, okay. uh, she you want to come on over? She's sitting, come on in. She's literally sitting right here going, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> so as I'm talking to you, she is sounding it out. And she's been doing that since you started. Flash cards. Quit talking. <laughs> you shouldn't be doing this interview at all. <laughs> Tell Eric yeah, to shut up. That's what she's saying right now. She's saying, turn off the camera now. You're ruining your career. <laughs> Run away. So, we can no, edit it. Does. We can edit it. Don't worry. So all, for every blog I've ever written, she always reads it. And Because uh, when I first write the blog, the only reason I write the blogs is somebody will get on TV and say something, and enough of them will do it that it aggravates me because they're putting out false information. They don't really know what they're talking about. And so yeah. I'll write the blog. And usually the first cut is very visceral. That dumb son of a bitch. You know? <laughs> and then she'll read it and say, you can't say this. You can't say that. Can you tone it down a little bit? Fix this and fix that. And then eventually it goes up. But tweets are the same way. Facebook posts, all that. Cool. Yeah. I think it's social media is a devil. I'm sure your publisher appreciates it. <laughs> I, I found myself, even since we've done this show, just because I don't want to alienate any of our viewers, I found myself really tempted to create a whole other account because there's so many things I, I wanted to comment on <laughs> yeah, the right. last months and I've just kind of like censored myself. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of becomes a why, right? Yeah. Yeah. You can't, I, I don't, you know, you can't say anything on social media without somebody getting upset. So yeah. uh, I just, I stay out of it. I have well, always made it a rule that I'm not doing politics from day one. I said, I'm not, there's no politics in my books. There's no politics in my blogs. They're just, this is, if I write about national security affairs and somebody takes a front to it because you, you know, it, I happened to ding, I mean, I ding the hell out of Obama about Libya. Now I ding Trump about torture. And it's just like, you know, you catch it from both sides. Like, yeah. yeah. When we talked to uh, Tony Tata, he said, cause he's on Fox news often. Mm -hmm. He goes, H half the country thinks I'm a genius and half the country thinks I'm an a-hole or an idiot. <laughs> he goes, it, yeah. So it's, I, I mean, so when I go on Fox news, it's, 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 I literally walk into the studio like this. <laughs> what are they gonna ask me shame 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 <laughs> so, so 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 brad let me ask you uh what have you found to be the most frustrating thing in the writing career that you now have um the most frustrating that'd be tough i think it's a pace in which just it's dealing with the publisher and it's social media i mean actually if i was going to pick it it'd be social media I wish social media did not exist um, yeah. because you, you have to get on it and it's, it just sucks your life away trying to, you know, it's just as Eric was saying, you've got to be on social media. So you're literally waking up in the morning saying, I got to schedule three posts and they've got to be witty <laughs> and they've got to go here. They got to go there and they got to do this and do that. And to me, that's just like, can I just write a book? 
Yeah. I always tell my wife, I'm J.D. Salinger. Nobody's ever going to see me. <laughs> I'm just going to write this stuff and let it out. <laughs> like Ben Coates that, just disappear. Just, yeah, ben yeah, Coast, yeah, it doesn't work that way. You have to engage. And I mean, I really love engaging with fans. I love this kind of stuff. It's fun. Yeah. But tweeting and, you know, Facebook posts and that kind of stuff. Just yeah, like, it's got to be interesting. It's got to be witty. I mean, you yeah. have to have all these parts to it. Yeah. It just can't be something. Well, what I always say is just, you know, I'm going to post three times a day. Buy my book. There's my social media presence. <laughs> I'm done with it. Here's the new scope that I bought today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, Brad, I was going to ask you. So, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of people like in, in, in our situation. I, I've got a book out. Everybody's kind of in that beginning phase mm -hmm. of, of the writing career. So, you know, looking back on when you started and where the market is today, do you have like a top two, top three kind of um, – uh, recommendations for people that are kind of just getting started in, in the business um, based on what you've it, seen. I, I, I'll have to say that I was really lucky, extremely lucky. I mean, lightning struck for me that uh, if you'd have told me how hard it was to get published, uh, I probably wouldn't even have tried. I mean, I had hmm. no idea because I just didn't know, you know, yeah. I didn't know anything about it. Um, that's probably not true. I probably still would have tried because I'm like, ah, hell, that's all <laughs> these other people. That won't be me. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the main thing is, is, is trying to keep up with uh, the trends on eBooks. And uh, I mean, a lot of stuff is going on that I still don't understand. One thing I would say is just learn the publishing world because it is just a beast and I yeah. still don't understand it. Okay. I don't understand so, how uh, stuff works. Another crazy world, publishing world's nuts. So's the film world. Um, what, if any, uh, contact have you had with that world? Have you, have you kind of just kind of like yeah. pushed it off and said, I'm not interested or? I have a little bit um, that you've talked to Mark Green. He's basically an expert as far as if you're talking to me, <laughs> he's the expert. Um, they I've had, a, I've been approached by a lot of people. And the hardest thing is, you know, a, are they actually going to make a movie and B yeah. if they do, are they going to keep true to your, you know, ethos of your books? And neither one of those has ever been satisfactory answered in my mind. So I have not uh, as of yet, have not optioned the rights to any of my characters uh, because of that reason. Because there's always some strange vibe. There's always fly-by-night people that come by, and yeah. all of them can claim something. I mean, they all claim, "Here's all the movies I worked on," and, and they probably did. But does that mean they're going to do anything? I don't. I don't yeah. know. They could have been craft services and, and <laughs> right. got a credit though. That's yeah. And so they, you know, once they own the rights to it, they own the rights to it. And right. so I've never had a, a time where I was really comfortable where I thought, oh, that's it. This, these guys are really going to do it. Uh, and so I, it probably more out of cowardice than it was out of any logical thinking. It was more like, nah, I'm backing off of that. So I, I wouldn't say cowardice at all. In fact, I'm, I'll toast that. Uh, you know, there's nothing more frustrating than as a fan of a novelist mm -hmm. or whatever, seeing an adaptation, you get all excited about it and it comes out and you're like, what the hell was that? Oh, that was nothing, nothing like the book I read. And it, <laughs> right. it, it somewhat takes away from it. And then, and then also because sometimes it'll plant the seed of, of an actor in that part. And then you go back and you start continuing the, the series of the books and that stupid actor keeps in, you know, right. I mean, and, and, and once they own it, and I, I mean, I don't blame them. So if a uh, studio is going to buy the rights to your, or option rights to your book, they're going to have a director that's got his vision for the movie. They're going to have an actor who's got his vision for the movie. Do they really want the author standing behind both of those guys with his vision? No, yeah. they're going to option the rights and they're going to do whatever the hell they want to. And that's why I've kind of... What, what I've never book. understood about that logic, though, is that a book is a sensation for a reason. Right. And, and I'll, I'll never understand why things are arbitrarily changed. I know sometimes things have to be changed, uh, but sometimes it seems it's so arbitrary. <laughs> well, so some of I mean, I mean, there's books that are changed... There's uh, a guy we know that uh, he's got credit for the book and they paid him for the book and the, the script has absolutely nothing to do with this book except for one little piece. I mean, it started out his book and then it just went off the rails this way and he's got one little piece in there. So he got paid, but it's nothing to do with this book uh, at all. They don't even credit it when it starts out. Jeez. All right. So who's, who, who's Pike Logan? You gotta, you gotta tell us who is no, Pike I don't Logan. do that. I learned that. Dang. There's another piece of advice. <laughs> Never say who you would have be your character. Really? Because, yeah, because it just turned to, we were on social media, Facebook or whatever, and then the fans started ripping into each other. I mean, attacking Ooh. each other. This <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> Blood and if, when I said that, you know, it should be character A, um, everybody that agreed with me loved me, and then because it's my character, I basically spit on everybody who said that 
It should be somebody else. Should be B. And they all got mad. They're like, you know, what do you know of old Can't make anybody happy. No, Jeez, so I just, I don't, man. I don't ever say anymore. It's like we, we might have to again. edit this answer out because we want our other authors to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't do it. I mean, we had so many uh, interesting fighting going on on Facebook. I'm like, I'm never going to say that again. You know? Well, so, I guess it's a smart thing, though. I mean, it makes sense. One yeah, because they, they, they all have their own ideas and they all go crazy. I mean, they were attacking each other on my Facebook page. I'm like, hey, everybody, let's kind of calm down here. You're the I one know. that said it should be this guy. I know when Tom Cruise took over the Jack Reacher uh, character, there probably was never a more polarizing choice than that. And yeah. uh, I know you initially, still see that. initially Lee tried yeah. to like, you know, defend the choice. Yeah. He was basically, de- you know, defending this, this deal he just made. You yeah. still and, see uh, that. He'll make a comment. You know, my 47,000 Jack Reacher books coming out. First comment. I hate Tom Cruise. Yeah. <laughs> that that might have been me that made that comment. <laughs> I don't hate Tom Cruise. I just hate him as Jack Reacher. <laughs> Listen, I mean, how much money did he get for that? So I'm, <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, I'm sure so he's doing Tom just Tom Cruise is the one that bought it. Wow. That's the first thing I said to Lee Child when I met him. I said, hey, I'm about Tom Cruise's height, and I look about as good as him. I, I don't think he thought it was funny, though. So. I'm so, sure he's sick of hearing it. You I'm sure know Tom Cruise. So, Brad, probably our last question um, before we jump to the next section, but, you know, there's a great crop of writers this year in 2019 and really a pretty all-star group coming out in 2020. Um, would you agree that the thriller market's in good hands, and, and is there anyone in particular or several of them that kind of stand out of going – Man, that's, you know, that's a great writer. Yeah, actually, uh, I just finished uh, Joseph, Joseph Fender's new book. It's a really good book, um, okay. House on Fire. Actually, it's got a Special Forces guy in it, so I, I was hesitant to read it because I was like, you know, usually you're gonna, I'm going to go, uh, That's not what they do. But he actually got it, everything pretty correct. And it, was, pretty right. it was actually a really enjoyable read. And Don Bentley's book's coming out. That thing is, that thing is on fire. I like yeah. that book a whole bunch. And I think the thriller genre itself is uh, – a lot of people say it's, you know, it's oversaturated or there's too many thrillers. And I'm like, I don't, I never believe that. I'm never, yeah, I'm yeah. never in competition with anybody. I mean, uh, Jack Carr's a great friend of mine. Billy's a friend of mine. They, it takes me a year to write a book. It takes people five days to read a book. I mean, if yeah. the book is good, they're going to buy them all. It's yeah, not like buy, buy another turn. one. If they're yeah. buying my book, it's not yeah. taken from his book. If they're buying his book, right. it's not taken from my book. They're going to buy them. I think that the, the thriller genre right now is in really good hands. Well, you don't go to the movie theater and, and decide to go through, see three movies, but you go to the bookstore, maybe you're going to buy a book and then you look yeah. over and you say, oh, hey, I like that one too. And then, you know, I, I never leave with more, with one book. It right. just never happens. And I think it's and I have exactly I've bought right. more books in airports that I still haven't read. It's like, hey, that looks like a great book. <laughs> Pull the paperback off and then get home and it's just sitting on the shelf. I'm like, all right, got yeah. to read that thing. Someday I'll get to it. Yeah. Well, that's the end of our questioning round. You survived that portion, but we are going to tap into your reserves here. This is what we call the lightning round. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> this is uh, where uh, very little thought was placed in our questions, and we don't expect any for answers. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to go first here. Um, I think somebody else wrote this, but I'm going to read it. I'm just going to claim that. Uh, the public hears from Navy SEALs almost on a daily basis in the media. Uh, while the unit guys stay mostly quiet, are Delta guys introverts or are SEALs just desperate to be liked? <laughs> <laughs> I'd say the one public mis- misperception about all this is there's a hell of a lot more SEALs than there are unit guys. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just it's a function of size. Numbers. All right. The you zombies are not coming. pissing anybody off with that answer. That was impressive. Yeah, he's pretty, uh, he knows what he's doing. Correct he is. <laughs> Damn it. All right. The zombies are coming. You can only grab one weapon out of the safe. What is it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you mean that? I, do, can I make my own safe up, or what I actually have? <laughs> what if, we don't know what you have. <laughs> yeah. I thought you lost them on the boating accident, right? It's probably a Mossberg shotgun. Yeah. That's oh, it's going to let them get up all close and personal. All right. Or a bazooka. The zombies. <laughs> <laughs> all right. The green machine develops a pill that gives you your 25-year-old body back. <laughs> if you agree to work as a unit operator for three years, does your wife agree to this? After my bitching about my knee, I think she would. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, ooh, a young, a young Brad, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, this is uh, something that we came across recently in one of our uh, previous podcasts. Have you ever had spotted dick? <laughs> I don't know what that is. 
<laughs> so, so you need to explain that one then. <laughs> it's a British sponge cake, but it's oh, perhaps, the most, <laughs> perhaps the most uh, sadly named food ever. Have you ever had stinky tofu? <laughs> stinky tofu. It smells like ass. We had it in Taiwan. <laughs> On purpose? Or was this just something? <laughs> I didn't eat it. I said, that's so damn stinky. <laughs> They're proud of it. So they, really? they advertise it, stinky well, tofu. Yeah. The, br- yeah. the British are very keen on their spotted what is dick. What's wrong with this show? Stinky tofu, spotted <laughs> dick. <laughs> what are we doing here? We're a food show now. A nasty uh, food show. You got to drink more. All right, that's that's <laughs> exactly. It. All right, <clears throat> your favorite Canadian rock band? Nickelback. Oh, <laughs> show's over. We'll see everybody next time on the edit, crew edit reviews. That, edit comment, <laughs> edit comment. I almost choked. <laughs> are they, are, they are Canadian, right? Yes, yeah. they are. Yes, okay. they are. <laughs> we sent them back three years ago. They are Canadian. <laughs> Absolutely. So. Oh, my goodness. <sighs> Hold on and, a minute. Uh, oh, thank God I'm done. Oh, you're up, Chris, and you can't even speak now. <laughs> no, still gagging. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on a second. Tiger Woods is a big fan of Nickelback. He actually has him do his Tiger Jam. Yeah, well, so, we saw what know, happened to him recently. They've got some pretty good fans. So. <sighs> All right, deep breath. <sighs> All right, so mine are fill in the blanks, Brad. So, uh, ready? Dear God, look at the size of those. Hooters. <laughs> <laughs> so where are we going? <laughs> First thing came to my mind. <laughs> We're done. That's the end. We don't need to. That's the end on it. that note, man. All right. Oh, my goodness. Next one. Look out behind you. It's a zombie. Zombie. Yeah, sure, right? He's got, he's got the Mossberg ready. He's got so. the Mossberg he's got a... or a bazooka. <laughs> um, <laughs> don't drink the water here. It's filled with <laughs> amoeba. <laughs> we just had my entire family was throwing up everywhere so don't oh, drink no. the water here it's the oh, stinky geez. tofu that's right <laughs> don't go to the taylor household <laughs> all right so uh ryan reynolds called me last night and said i'd like to be pike logan oh Ooh. see yeah i knew we i can't did say it. whether we like that or not but three, three or four of us do <laughs> three, three or four of the crew i do raise your hand if you like it mm, i can't go. raise my hand and there's mike oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> No. And my last one, Die Hard is a Christmas movie because Jingle Bells is all the way through it. Yeah. It just keeps going. <laughs> it is a Christmas movie. It's it the is best the one ever. It is. Yeah. I watched it, Die Hard. I watched it Thursday weapon. night. Thank you. Lethal mm-hmm. Weapon and Die Hard. They're Lethal Weapon Yeah, too. Lethal Weapon's my favorite Christmas Absolutely. movie. Absolutely. Yep. Jingle Bell, um, Jingle Bell. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, um, my... My first um, question is, what, what percentage of the military operations you participated in remain classified? Oh, uh, depending on what you mean by operations, probably 95%. 95%. Wow. Still. Wow. I mean, just cl- assuming that uh, I was in the unit when 9-11 happened, so I would consider that to be operational. Before then, it was all exercises. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Is it 20 years for you or what? Or is it uh, just... I was in for 22 years, yeah. No, but I mean the, the operations for, for classification. Is it 20 years or is it imper... imper... Oh, that's all depends on... It's, that's actually all uh, fuller requests. So if somebody says, I want to know about this operation, then they'll automatically declassify it at 25 years oh. or it gets reclassed based on adjudication or somebody says, I want to see this, and then they'll... Got it. Up in the fight. Got it. Got it. Mm. Okay. Um, what is the most accurate portrayal of First Special Forces Operational Detachment Delta on film? Delta Force of Chuck Norris. Yeah, the motorcycles <laughs> with the rockets. That's the most accurate? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Love Chuck Norris. <laughs> Who does? I was expecting Black Hawk down. I don't know why. <laughs> Jack Carson, Navy the SEALs for, for, for the SEAL team. So. Yeah, yeah, he's exactly. a Charlie you know. Sheen. Because he likes Charlie that jump Sheen. scene. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay, so question number three. It looks like my Irish might meet your Longhorns in a bowl from the latest projections. What is our wager? Mm. Ooh. Oh. Mm. He's saying he wants to wager a Notre Dame Longhorns. <laughs> no, she I don't, laughs. Your, your wife laughs. That's she another laughs at you. <laughs> a stinky at tofu. Well, by the hey, love. It, <laughs> hey, Brad, okay. last time I took okay. a bet with him, with uh, Sean on this, uh, Michigan won. Yeah, yeah, yeah he... I lost the Michigan. Yeah, there, UT. So. I don't have a lot of faith in UT right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, now she's saying, "Who are you?" I'm sorry. Somebody watching this? I love UT. <laughs> I've got a bottle of Jamesons. <laughs> all you Paul Longhorn Jameson. fans out there, there I love is. you. <laughs> okay. Cut and edit. Question, question number four, and and this might be sensitive too. What's the best restaurant in Charleston, and what's your favorite menu item? 
Paul's Chop House, Bone In Ribeye. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Got it down. Time to, yeah. Make sure we record that. Enemy of Mine, try that. Into the Book. Some... It's Into Ooh. the Book. Enemy yeah, of mine. yeah, it is. It is, yeah. It is. Okay. One fictional character you would like to have under your command on a mission? One fictional character? Yeah. Pike Logan. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of. <laughs> I, I almost put, except for <laughs> Pike Logan. Logan. said, except <laughs> Pike Logan. <laughs> Uh, Somebody asked me the other day, said, who's your favorite fictional character? I'm like, is that really you're asking the author who his favorite fictional character is? <laughs> it's that small mouse in that children's book. Chuck Norris. Mike Logan. <laughs> All right. Oh. Okay, I'm up. So um, this might have happened a few times already in the interview today, um, Brad. So, you know, that person's looking across from you maybe right now. When you get in trouble, what does the deputy commander of everything say to you? She's right now waving her arms and saying, you can't say that about the Longhorns. <laughs> <laughs> wave off. Wave off. You get the wave That's off. Exactly you what she's doing. Him, so. She's doing this. <laughs> you bet on them so people can't complain. because you Yeah, bet. you bet. bet so it, you're putting your money there. So uh, Pike Logan walks into a bar, and they just serve the last rum and Coke. I know your catch word will probably be damn it, but what's uh, Pike going to go to for his uh, backup drink? Ah, uh, he would probably go with the bourbon. Go with the bourbon. Of course. Yeah. Very He's good. a good man. So, yeah. yeah. I, I would say my wife now drinks Moscow Mules, but Pike can't possibly drink that because he would collapse in a heap. <laughs> a good drink. That's a good drink. <laughs> Staying on the uh, drinking uh, topic, um, can you name an author you haven't met yet that you'd love to go out and just have a couple drinks with and just shoot the breeze? Uh. I, actually, there's a couple of them that I've met, but I haven't did get a chance to talk to. Like Robert Crace, I'd love to go out and talk to him uh, and just shoot the breeze with him. Big favorite of mine. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I've met him, but I haven't really talked to him. Yeah. Cool. Um, so clearly, you're a pretty well-traveled person. You travel for your book research and everything. But what's on your bucket list? Where would you like to visit that you haven't been to yet? Uh, we're still going through that. We're slowly but surely knocking them all out. So the last one was Elaine wanted to dive the Great Barrier Reef. So I had to figure out how can I put up Australia in this book? <laughs> the, uh, if I had a bucket list, I, I, you know, actually probably Alaska. I haven't been to Alaska. I might go there. I'm surprised. Mark Cameron's up there. Mark, Mark Cameron, Cameron would, have us, right. would have you up there. Mark Cameron would yeah. love to have us around the campfire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good he, man. he joked with us about that. He said, we need to have everyone up on the campfire yeah. and just sit around and tell stories and stuff. We're like, we're there. We're there, Mark. So. <laughs> Done. Yeah, Alaska okay, so my beautiful. Yeah, it is. Uh, my final question. The task force needs to bait and catch a ruthless Russian assassin. Maybe something like out of, you know, the most recent book. Which member of the crew are you putting out there as bait and why? Yeah. It would be Eric. you, Eric. Yes, yeah, of right course it, it is. That's the perfect answer. It's like you and Eric and say podcast. anything. What the hell? Now, from a heterosexual standpoint, which one are you putting out there? <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. This is what I have to deal with, Brad, every single week. It works say, out. They He's say this gimp. is my fault, too. You <laughs> asked the question. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you opened you yourself serve, up to it. You served that one up, man. He just <laughs> liked it. Dude. Okay. Dude, there was Point no taken. hesitation in his answer. No. Zero. In none of the authors so far. All right. Yeah, exactly. Thanks to Brad Taylor for coming on board. And, Thank uh, you for having me. Books and yeah, appreciate it. Wonderful. Are we going to see you at uh, Thriller Fest this coming summer? Yes, definitely. Well, I mean, fantastic. I have no plans not to go. Put it that way. Got it. So, so all we'll right. Well, drink with you. Cheers to you. Cheers to your new book coming Hunter out. Hunter Killer. Hunter Killer. Hunter Killer. Thank it's you for a having great me. Book, and uh, we'll see you soon on the crew. What, what's the release date of Hunter Killer? Uh, January seventh. January seventh. Right. Yeah. Pick it up. Buy it. Cool. See ya. We'd like to thank Brad Taylor for coming on the crew reviews today and for his service to our country. Hunter Killer is the 14th installment of the Pike Logan series set to release January 7th, 2020. So go out and buy it for another episode of the crew reviews. Gentlemen, we'd like to toast show it gentlemen. Good show. Thank you. That's all right. All right, now how do I turn this off without blowing my computer up? <laughs> Outro here. Oh my gosh. Oh, now what the? F? My wife is burning shit. She cooking?
We're recording. Make sure that makes the highlight film, you bastard. Female secret service agents can't cook. Dude. <laughs> oh, he's recording. I was already recording. Got it. Damn it. We'd like to thank Brad for coming on the crew reviews today. No, we don't. For nope. service to nope. our country. No, no, no. Yeah, see, no, we you don't. can't. You're no. trying to manufacture. No, but no, no. Problems. Brad, who? This Sean. <laughs> you can't just like say Brad. Brad. This was at the end of the show. The they outro. knew who Brad. Still got to say his name. All right. Better th- yeah, that actually right yeah, there is good. Real right good. there. No, no. Ooh. What? What? What's that? Hello, well, Papa. No, I can't see. How are you? <laughs> can't see. <laughs> Just a bunch of blurry. We're back to Adam. We'd like to thank dick. Barack. I put it on 32 font so I can read it. 32 font. <laughs> That's how you should do your you do your intro like that. I'm oh yeah. Okay. During that time, he held numerous infantry and special forces positions, including eight years in First Special Forces Operational Attachment Delta. He's got to know Chuck Norris, right? And we're toasting a word from Spotted Dick. (laughs) Spotted Dick talks? Oh, my God. (laughs) No, they, well, they kind of are in the same boat because I'm writing a book about it. (laughs) (laughs) Now we know what's coming next. Really? (laughs) Actually, Hong Kong's screwing me up. I'm like, what the hell's going on in Hong Kong? Come on. Would you solve your problem so I can write mine? (laughs) With 13 previous installments and more than 2 million copies sold, the series has consistently hit New York Times bestseller list. Ooh. Let's see. 2 million copies, agent fees. Yeah. Wow. He's probably made at least $13,000 since he started. Damn good. That's awesome. Oh, my gosh. I felt I, when I was Googling Spotted Dick to get some uh, images for it, I was like, oh, please, just please just be the food. <laughs> and the crew review sucks. <laughs> <Allie ho. laughs> i guess that was wonderful that's that good wonderful. perfect that's good hey, and print and cut okay 